Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. So since we're all in a very interesting time together and we're stuck at home, why not spend some time together? So I have a whole bunch of projects in lab number two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the projects and we're just going to take a look inside and see what we're up against before the restoration actually happens. As you know, for most of you that have been watching this channel for a very long time, a restoration on anything takes a lot of time. It's usually about two weeks of video time for me, and that gets condensed into a half an hour or an hour, because of course lots of clip cutting and all sorts of things like that. So in order for me to get a whole bunch of videos up a lot faster so that we can spend some time together since we are kind of stuck right now, what I'm going to do is just grab these things, we'll look through them. We'll take a look at see what we're up against and I'll explain a little bit of the circuitry and then shortly down the road we'll revisit these things and we'll restore them together. So it should be a lot of fun. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab a very interesting piece of gear that I picked up quite a long time ago. I've only ever seen one and the unit that you're going to see is that one very rare piece so we'll take a look inside and i'll explain a little bit what it's about kind of a really neat receiver let's put it that way so anyways let's get started utility public address tuner kind of an interesting name for something well, what is this well as you can see it's a broadcast band radio receiver that doesn't have an oscillator there's no oscillator in this thing reason being is you can have another one of these sitting right beside it and they won't interfere with each other. So in a scenario way back when, like say in a school or hotel or motel or hospital or something like that, there's lots of rooms. And if say the people in the rooms want to listen to a radio station, they would have the audio lines from this in a main office running into the room and they'd have a selector switch and you can select between either receiver. And that'll allow you to listen to two separate radio stations. Well, you're saying, well, why not put a radio receiver in everybody's room? Well, way back when, radio receivers were extremely expensive. So having two radio receivers and just a whole bunch of audio lines running into each room saves a lot of money. Each room would have maybe a small little amplifier or something like that with a speaker in it. And you could just click a switch back and forth and choose whatever frequency you want and you're not only limited to two you could have more of these things if you wanted depending on how much money the hotel motel school whoever wanted to spend on these things again not having an oscillator in each one of these is absolutely crucial so this way one won't interfere with the other very neat design so you see it's not in great shape the paint on this somebody has tried to repaint this and on the top it's you know Looks like it's been rubbed pretty thin. Definitely doesn't look very good. So I would want to repaint the case. I'll prob I would probably take this whole thing apart and sandblast it and then end up repainting it to make it look as good as possible. As you can see on the face here, you know, there is no dial needle. So whether it's inside or not, I don't know. So it's going to need a, a new pointer or a pointer to be put back in place. This is some sort of a control tone or volume. We'll take a look at that here in a little bit. That'd be the on off switch and again tone or volume so i did get a folder with a bunch of paperwork with this and we'll take a look at that together so we'll discover everything about this together it'll be interesting to see what's inside this thing let's take a look at the back here obviously somebody didn't want the thing to be plugged in and an rca with a cable whatever and a whole bunch of connections here again you know antenna ground that's pretty self-explanatory so I imagine this will all be in the manual so lots of stuff for us to discover together so what I'm going to end up doing is getting that paperwork together and I'll reposition the camera we'll take a look at the paperwork and then I'll remove the screws on the face these screws here look relatively new the rest of them are kind of kind of grungy looking anyways we'll take a look at the paperwork and see what they have to say about it and then I'll remove the screws and pull this out and we'll see what's inside this I can move it around and it's pretty solid so I know there isn't any rocks in this but it is heavy I can tell you that this is a heavy little unit here's a view of the data sheet that I've received with this utility public address tuner if you want you can pause the video if you want to read all of this in a moment i'll just zoom on into one portion of this and i'll quickly explain this give you an idea of their intention for this utility public address tuner i also received a schematic and a pictorial view of the underside of the chassis so just say 
the person that bought this didn't know how to read a schematic or something like that or follow a schematic, you could follow the pictorial view on the bottom side and put this together relatively easy. So I'll show you all that stuff here in just a moment. So if you want to pause the video now to read this, you can feel free to do that. And in a moment here, what I'll do is I'll just zoom on into the first portion of this and quickly give you an explanation of their intention. At the top, it reads, the Messenger Utility public address tuner has been designed to fill the need for a practical radio tuner capable of supplying undistorted, high-quality reproduction of broadcast programs to the input stage of a power amplifier system. The tuner employs a TRF, or, if you'd like, tuned radio frequency circuit, to supply that quality so sought after for public address work. It uses ferrocart iron core coils to obtain the selectivity and sensitivity required. So basically what they're saying is this is going to be a relatively wide bandwidth receiver because it doesn't have an oscillator. So it's going to have a high fidelity AM sound to it, which will be kind of nice to listen to. The absence of an oscillator makes these tuners absolutely non-interfering regardless of the number that may be grouped together in a multiple channel public address system, such as used in schools, hospitals, leading hotels, etc. to furnish a selection of programs. The shape of the tuner is designed to facilitate close grouping, permitting two units to be mounted side by side on one relay rack panel or in one institutional sound system cabinet. So they're trying to make these things so that they can be grouped together, as I mentioned before. And it just goes on and on if you want to keep on reading. But that gives you an idea of what their intended application, I should say, is for this system. Again, it'll be really nice to listen to some nice, you know, AM through this, some music through it, and see how good it actually sounds once this thing is completely rebuilt. Okay, let's get inside this thing and see what it looks like. Because it really doesn't matter if I slip with this flathead screwdriver because it's going to end up getting repainted anyways. So the, uh, so one thing with these slotted screwdrivers is very easy to slip and scar up a face on something. It's a nice thing about a Phillips or a Robertson type screwdriver. I really like Robertson screws. Here we go. All right. Let's move this down like so. Make sure that nothing is on any of the cords. I think I should be able to push that out. Boy, that sure doesn't want to come out very easy. Wow, that's in there good. Put this over the edge of the bench for a sec and see if I can give this a tug. Oh, it's catching the dial face, that's what it's doing. There we go. So pull this out. Give you guys some of the experience with it. Boy, this is really a tackle pulling this thing out. It's pulling my mat up and everything. Nice heavy beast. There it is. Get the case out of the way. Okay, even that case is heavy, wow. So what I'm gonna do here is just move this off the bench for a second and straighten the mat out. Let's pull the mat right off here. And we'll take a look at this. Well, right away it's missing a tube here. We'll move in. And that would be the dial string. Get a little bit better light on this. There we go. So yeah, as you can see, the dial string is completely off. I don't see a needle, the dial pointer, or dial needle anywhere in there. So it looks on the top side to be in not bad condition. Again, missing a tube. So I'll have to take a look for that tube here in a little bit. Let's take a look at the underside. This is where it gets interesting always. Uh, it's not looking too bad, actually. 
So give me just a moment here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have to put some solder rules under this or something just to steady this up and then I'll zoom on in and we'll take a closer look at the underside. Looking at the bottom side of the chassis, it doesn't look to be in all that bad a condition. You can see somebody's replaced some of the capacitors here. Look at the lead length on that thing just hanging in mid-space. And they've replaced this one here, and then of course this would be added on the underside. I've also noticed that a lot of the rubber wiring is, you know, breaking away as you can see here. So that would all need to be replaced, and that is running over to this area right here on the upper side. So chances are that looks like a filter cam. It is. Oh, and it's actually blistered on the side too. I'll show you that in just a bit. So that filter cap is in bad condition. So obviously filter caps always have to go at any rate. Somebody's installed some diodes on the bottom side here and they've curled the leads to act as thermal decoupling when they've soldered the diodes in, which is, um, you know, good thought, I guess you could say, you know, trying to protect the diodes, maybe from his blazing hot, you know, 500 watt solderzilla or something like that, right? So a lot of these older units were soldered with soldering irons that, um, you know, look like a crowbar filed off on the end and, you know, heated over a campfire, right? So, you know, it just depends. So somebody may have had a really big iron and they just didn't want to burn up the diodes. Here's another one here. Nice looking little glass diode over here. Again, some curls in the leads for thermal decoupling, which is kind of nice. All the waxies would have to go just like in every restoration. And uh, boy, there's a lot of, you can see, I don't know if you can see that in the camera. Lots of whiskers on this stuff here, so that'll all have to be cleaned off. You can scrape all those whiskers off on the side there, so that's obviously going to not be a good situation. They look like little fibers all over the place. So anyways, these resistors are the bed type resistors. So when I say bed, I mean B-E-D, like the bed you sleep in. And that's the way you read them, body and dot. So body, the color of the body first, the end, and then the dot. So yellow is four, black is zero, and then this is orange, so that would be the number three. So that's the multiplier, so you put three zeros there. So it'd be four, zero, 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 so 40,000 ohms. Very easy to read these older resistors like that. So, and then in this case here, you can see that the body is red, so that's two. The end is black, which is zero again. And then we have five zeros here, which is green, so that's two mega ohms. Things like that. So very easy to read these things. Lots of roundies in here. So all the roundies would have to be tested. You'll notice on the roundy resistors here, there is no fourth band. I can zoom in on that just a little better. I will have to touch up the focus here. So you can see on these resistors here, there is no fourth band. So this is 100K ohms. And no fourth band means 20% tolerance. So these you know have a very wide tolerance on the most modern resistors have a silver or gold band. And, you know, some of the better ones, you know, have a red band on them, things like that. And you can see these are the roundies. Again, roundies are, have a porous body on them, so they're, you know, kind of susceptible to moisture ingression over the years. So they do move around in value of, you know, say this unit was stored in a garage or in an attic or some, you know, area where the climate isn't temperature controlled or something like that. So these will all have to be tested. In fact, what we'll do here in a moment is we'll test some of these components as well and just see how bad this thing really is. Testing wax capacitors is not really needed because they just have to go. Any of these capacitors that you see in a unit like this, they're just garbage, right? So any cap with a wax coating on it, if you're new to this channel, know this now. There's no excuses for leaving any of these things behind. If you test them with a normal capacitor tester, a lot of the times they'll test fine. So that can be a trick. In fact, they look like they're overachievers. Sometimes they'll say like 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 microfarad, and they might read 0 0.03 on your meter. And you're thinking, wow, you know, this is a really good capacitor. Well, the reason that it's reading higher is because there's internal leakage. And when I say leakage, I mean that inside these resistor or inside these capacitors, they're decaying and they're turning into resistors effectively. So any capacitor with a wax coating is out of there. These are definitely gone. This is really old as well, this electrolytic, so it'll have to go and it's been tacked into circuit here and everything. 
So I'll just zoom back out here, get a better overview of everything and touch up the focus. So these capacitors here are probably going to be okay. These domino style mica capacitors are usually, you know, fine. Sometimes they hide paper inside these things. So if you're unsure, you know, on the parts list, if it says that it is a paper capacitor or it is unlisted, whether it's mica or paper, it's always a good idea to leakage test these things. So if they are paper, they'd have to go as well. But most of the time, the capacitors that hide in this you know, domino style package are a mica and they're okay to leave behind. Now that's, you know, if the case isn't cracked, if there's a crack in the case or something like that, then of course it would have to go. Now, some of these components here were hand-picked at the factory in some receivers. I'm probably not thinking it's too particular in this TRF set, but they are hand-picked at, uh, at the factory and many of the higher-end receivers to make the dial track correctly so that everything works, so the oscillator works correctly and all that kind of stuff. So if you don't have to replace them, you don't want to replace them. But if you have to, well, then sometimes you'll be fiddling around with it for a while to make everything work out right. So I've gone through that in some of my earlier videos. You can see that in some of my receiver restoration videos. A little capacitor down here. Looks like that is across a 400 ohm resistor. Interesting. A reactor over here. It'd be interesting to look at that on the schematic. So a lot of the times these bed type resistors can be left alone as well, just depending on how far out of value they are. Again, this has to go, this has to go, this has to go. This will have to go too, because this will most likely be leaky. This will go, this will go, this will go, this will go here, this will go, this will go, and that capacitor there will go. Oh, let's take a look at that um, blistery capacitor. I don't know if you can see that. The metal is actually blistered there. I'll see if I can uh, touch up the focus on that again. You see that? That is not good. Looks like it may have even split or something here. Look at that. Can you see that? Let's see if I can get the light on that a little better. No, I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. Kind of a... Uh, Case is just all cracking on this right there. So definitely a bad cap that would have to go. I'll grab my rolls of solder here and support the transformer. That worked really well. Pretty much even. I can almost put a level on this thing. Those two rolls of solder hold this perfectly even. This would have to go. These old porcelain style capacitors are often leaky as well. So ceramic, I should say, ceramic style capacitors. So I can quickly test these here with you and just show you, you know, give you a quick example of how bad these things really are. And we'll go through and test a few components. And um, let's see here on the other side, I'm gonna also need to find a tube for this. So there is a legend here. There's also a legend on the, on the schematic itself. So that is there. So we'll just uh, grab the schematic. Let's move out of the way here. Okay. Pardon all the bumping of the mic and everything. Okay. So here we go. Let's touch up the focus again. And there it is, 6F8G. So it's a glass tube, it looks like it has a shield on it. So what I'll have to do is use my transport powers and transport a 6F8 here. And there it is. So there we go, 6F8. Brand new. I don't know if it's the right box, though. Looks brand new. Sicilian, but it says Rogers. Hmm, interesting. Put that in there like so, and that can stay in there until we do the uh, restoration. I got two ST-style tubes here, and they're kind of bumping shoulders. So these are classified as shoulder-type tubes, ST. So this is the shoulder on the tube. 
And as you can see, these two tubes are bumping shoulders. So, yeah, down the road I might see if I can maybe... Well, it might fit the shield in there. They might just have to touch. And uh, if the tube is fine, I'd, there's no need to replace it. But there are... Um, this uh, is a, what, 5Z4, I think it was? Yeah, 5Z4. So the 5Z4 rectifier down here could be replaced with a non-shoulder type tube, something like this, just a standard G type tube, possibly. Let's see how that goes. Nice four gang tuning capacitor. Look at that. Mm, looks like somebody's moved some of the plates around to make it track correctly. The outer plates you can move. You see these cuts in the in the tuning capacitor plates? That's so you can bend. So that's so you can bend these out or in to make it track correctly. So a lot of the times you'll have to have this one out here and then you bend the one on the bottom out even more and then that way when you move this around the dial tracking is correct to what's on the dial. So ways that you can fine tune these things. I'll talk more about that here when we actually go about aligning this thing and restoring it. Here's a closer view of the schematic, and it's really quite simple. So it's gonna have lots of gain. It's got three 6K7s in the front end here, and it's a TRF set. So each stage is being tuned by that large capacitor that we just looked at. So there's one there, one there, one there, and one there. So they're tuning this whole chain. So there's gonna be a lot of sensitivity in this receiver, I'm sure. So again, that's these sections here. So they're all ganged together. When they're ganged together, that means that they're just attached together and by one common shaft. So when you move the one shaft, all of them move at the same time. So each one of these is being adjusted at the same time. This is that tube that was missing. So just an amplifier that would drive this output section here that would go to an audio amplifier. And the 5Z4, which is a rectifier in a full wave configuration. So center tap to ground. And then we have the two ends, as you can see, running to each plate. So the top end here runs over to this plate, and then the bottom end runs over to this plate here. So we have a full wave configuration. Pi setup over here, we have a 30 Henry, and the choke, which is uh, rated at 40 milliamps. That'd be almost kind of fun to experiment in some Heising situations, but at any rate, Heising transmitter situations. But uh, 216 microfarad, 300 volt electrolytic capacitors here. So when I replace these, chances are there'll be 22. So this will be 22 and 22, something like that. So something close to this. Right? It's not that incredibly important. They even put current ratings here, 27 milliamp uh, total current on this line here. So if you were to cut this line here and measure it, you know, 27 milliamps. 5 volt winding for the 5Z4, and then we have a Y and X that runs up to the heaters on all of these, I imagine. So, yeah, we see Y and X, Y and X on all of these, right? And it's a balanced filament system, so that center tap runs to ground as well. Very simple, very, very simple. See the dial lights are across Y and X, it has two dial lights. And very easy to adjust, RF, 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 and antenna. So this should be a lot of fun to work on. I'm really looking forward to getting this thing working. Here's the pictorial view of the bottom side of the chassis, and they did a really nice job drawing this out. So say you had a problem reading the schematic, this would make it really easy to assemble, right down to where to put the solder blobs to hold the woven shield onto the chassis. Very nice. One thing I should mention is when you see 40M, that means 40K ohms. Don't get confused and think that's meg ohms. A lot of people do, especially if you're used to working on modern stuff and then you come and work on some older stuff. 40K ohms, 40K ohms, 25K ohms. Whenever you see meg, it means meg. So you can see two meg. That means two meg ohms. So what would this be? 50K. Right? What would this be? 100K. That's the way it is. A lot of these older schematics are drawn like this. Whenever you see just numbers like this, that's ohms itself. So 5,000 ohms. See 400? That means 400 ohms. 400 ohms. 400 ohms. And so on. 
Let's test some of the components on the underside of this chassis using this curve tracer. The reason I'm using this curve tracer is because I don't have to fiddle with any adjustments. I can just leave everything the way it is and just test the components in circuit. And there is some diodes in here as well. We can look at those diodes with the curve tracer. So let's check it out. So let's test these two power supply diodes that somebody has soldered in here with the curly cues in the legs. And I'll tell you what I see on the screen here. And the diode is okay. And it's also indicating some capacitance there. The capacitance is the circular portion at the bottom. So no problems there. Let's test the other diode. No problems with that diode as well. So both the power supply diodes are okay. And they're oddly enough in parallel with the vacuum tube. So technically if you pull the vacuum tube out, this thing should still work. The same goes for this diode over here. We pull this vacuum tube out. There's a diode on the bottom as well. So it's kind of double duty going on here. We have tubes and solid state devices that work at the same time. You can see at the output of the rectifier here, we have a line going off to this filter capacitor. And then there's a negative or common lead that's running off to the chassis from that filter can there. So if I go from the chassis to this point here, so I'm basically looking at one 16 microfarad portion in that capacitor, I should get a line that's straight up and down or just a slight angle to it. And let's see what happens. No go. So that capacitor is definitely bad and there is no surprise. That capacitor on the upper side, it was blistered and cracked, right? So it's obviously bad. Same thing applies to this. I should get either a straight up and down or a slight angle to this. And there we go. So we obviously know why this one has been installed. If I look at this capacitor here and just test for capacitance, I should get what looks like a circle on the screen. Now keep in mind that this is not looking at leakage. This is just looking at capacitance. Leakage test and ESR test and all that is a completely separate test. So here we go. And there it is. So it has capacitance. This one's close to the same value, this green one here. So 0.15 and 0.15. So it should indicate very close to the same. And there we go. Now, these ones here are 0 0.05 microfarad, so they don't have as much capacity. So I should get what looks like an oblonged circle on the screen. And that's if the capacitance of this is okay. Again, not testing for leakage or anything else. And there it is. So this has capacitance. Let's test this one right here, see if it has capacitance. And it does as well. So let's take a look at this diode over here, this glass diode. Yep. And it is okay. And as you can see, it has a sloppy knee. And that sloppy knee is indicating that it is a germanium diode. If this was a silicon diode, that would be a straight, very tight angle like this. And you can see it has kind of have a sloppy knee and it's kind of off on an angle. That indi indicates a germanium device. So there we go, it's a germanium device. And that's exactly what it is. Now this doesn't need to be in here and neither do these. I'm gonna remove all these in the restoration at any rate, just because I want this to be as original as possible when we try this thing out. You know, no help with any you know, solid state diodes or anything like that. And there we just get rid of all of the modern components and bring this back to the way it was way back when. Now I can keep going and test resistors and everything like that, and I'll save some of that for when we actually do the restoration. So all in all, I'm not seeing anything that's, you know, very, very bad in here. I'm, you know, seeing what I'm expecting to see. I can give you a quick example of uh, leakage in these capacitors. I'll do that here in just a moment. Let's test this ceramic capacitor right here. So first of all, let's take a look at its actual value. So this is rated at 0.15. And it reads 0 0.17, 0 0.18 really, 0.179. So most people would look at this and think, oh, wow, it's an overachiever. It's actually doing okay. Well, in a way, this is telling us already that this is leaky because this is taking longer to charge because of its internal leakage. And that's why this is giving us a higher capacitance value. What these meters do is they measure the amount of time it takes to charge the capacitor. And it does some math and gives you a capacitance reading. So... Now, don't let that fool you. Sometimes these capacitors will read very close to what they are, and they are still leaky. It's just that this one here looks abnormally leaky. So what I'll do here is just click this on to test. And this is an actual leakage tester. So this is going to look at this capacitor's leakage. So 
put the sense lead on here, and if this is not leaky, in a very short period of time, this should count down and that should go green. So, you know, we're talking in the range of about, you know, 10 seconds or something like that. And as you can see, you know, it's just not budging. So whereas if I take a, a modern capacitor right here and do the same thing, so I'll just remove this. I'll put this on here. I'll put this onto a modern capacitor. Let's hold it up here and wait just a moment as this charges. And as you can see, no problems. Now, if I click this onto forecast, that's an extremely sensitive setting. So that's used for testing micas and things like that. If this capacitor was at all leaky, that would count right back up to the top one and this would go red again. So these capacitors here are fantastic capacitors, these ones. So these are Illinois capacitors. I have an entire list of these things. I've spent a lot of time grading and rating lots of different capacitors, and I've put the lists up on Patreon. There's lots of them I've spent tons of time with. So uh, I can very comfortably say that these are just wonderful capacitors. And both of these are up on, on Patreon as well. So if you're interested in building this device or this device, this was a $5 oscilloscope that I turned into a curve tracer. All the plans are up there to build all of this stuff. So if you're interested, definitely check that stuff out. So at any rate, we can definitely see that this thing is going to be loaded with faulty components. Testing these wax capacitors is really not even worth it because they're just, they're going to be so bad. There's no point. So all of that stuff is going to have to be replaced. And then at the time when we go about doing the rebuild on this thing, you know, completely restoring this thing, I'll go through and test some of these bed style resistors and the roundies as well. And we'll take a look at some of their values and uh, see how far off they are. Now, as I've mentioned in many of my other restorations, that if these are close to value, and even the uh, the roundies are close to value, a bunch of them are close, I'll just leave them in. If I find one of two, one or two of them that are just way off, so say that this 100k ohm resistor was, you know, way, way out, I would be going, okay, I'm going to replace that one. And if I tested one extra one and it was way out, then they'd all get replaced. So you kind of have to make an assumption. If you see two of them that are way off, there's a good chance that there's a, uh, I'll just move the focus over to the chassis there. There's a really good chance that this thing was stored in a very bad atmosphere. And at that point, it's just, you know, since these things are a, a porous kind of, I guess you could say case on them, they're, they're really prone to moisture ingression. So definitely want to get those out of there. Look at this one here. Look at the length of the leads. Somebody just tacked that in there. So, yeah, definitely a lot of things that need to be addressed in this thing, but it should be a very fun restoration, and I'm really looking forward to getting started on this. If you're enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and definitely hang around. Lab number two has literally tons of equipment in it, and when I say tons, there is a lot of weight in that lab. What I'm going to do is just randomly take things off the shelf and put it on the bench here, and we'll take a look inside. I have a lot of really neat pieces in there, and as I have mentioned before in my videos, when I get this stuff, I don't look inside this stuff myself. I just grab it, put it on the shelf, and I save that experience for both of us together. So when I open this thing up, if I find a brick inside it or a bunch of rocks or gravel or something, a lot of it feels like it could have that inside. They're so heavy. We'll experience all of this together. So it'll be a lot of fun. So if you haven't subscribed, definitely do that. And if you want to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap that bell symbol. On Patreon, I have 90 videos on there right now, so if you want to see more of my videos, tons of videos there, and they're projects that you can take part in. I'm sharing many of my inventions and creations and just personal circuit designs up there as well. Lots of very neat pieces of custom test gear for you to build to make your troubleshooting all that much more easy. It is an ongoing electronics course, so I'm continually adding neat new things, many things that you've probably never even heard or seen before. So it is a lot of fun. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab. So if you click on the Show More tab, it'll expose the link and I'll pin the link at the top of the comments section. So definitely check that out. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.